Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction, but more importantly, it's about recovery. And it's brought to you by our friends at knowyourscript.org. Matt, you can go to knowyourscript.org and find out what? Everything there is to know about how to understand and manage prescriptions, uh, specifically painkillers, opioids. You can figure out kind of what you think about it because there's lots of information for you there. Lots of information about how to talk to your doctor because a lot of people get sort of tongue-tied and intimidated, I think. And so it gives you some good suggestions on how to talk to your doctor about alternatives to opioid pain medicine and how to manage it health in a healthy way. And how to, if you're a parent or if you're a guardian of some other kids, how to help your kids be educated on it and have that conversation and, and have that conversation. I've, I've done that. Um, I think their website's really, really helpful. And then with um, a couple of my kids, we've talked about alternatives after they've had some minor surgeries and and uh, it's been great. So I, I really appreciate their website. It's a good resource. Well, it's good to have you back in studio. I know you're uh, still affected a little bit by the COVID-19. Yeah, I can't believe I got it. Dead tired. I'm really, yeah, really tired. Actually, today seems kind of like a rebound day. Yesterday, I was feeling pretty good mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, did my normal 12, 13 hour day. Mm-hmm. And then today, uh, I, I was like, man, if I could have skipped today, I would. But Got to work. Well, I'm glad you're here because you add so much to the show, and it's good seeing you in person. Thanks, buddy. Hey, so I was at this uh, recovery expo uh, right. last week called the We Are One Recovery. Yeah. And uh, it's a couple of cool things happened. One, I met uh, the Attorney General Sean Ray's assistant, or somebody in his cabinet. Or somebody who said that they worked for him. But no, I'm pretty sure they did, because what they had was, is they had this uh, kind of a questionnaire, because Utah's about to get a lot of money for Big Pharma for a settlement for the opioid epidemic. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so it was kind of, if you remember about 15, 20 years ago, Utah got a big lump money from the tobacco companies. Right. And so that kind of fueled uh, helping you to quit and all the stuff that goes along with that. And so what she was there for, she was like, well, we're getting this big lump sum of money, so we want to know where it's best spent. And she goes, we're better than a recovery expo to find out where you think it was. So I will try to get the the questionnaire and put it on our Facebook and let people talk about that. So that was kind of cool. So they wanted to know what, what people attending the conference, where they thought that money could go to do what? Like help educate people? Educate, help, rehabilitation. Get recovery program, stuff all like of that. Those. Okay, And cool. so that was kind of cool. But I was there, and it was an amazing event. It was myself, Rob Eastman, mm-hmm. uh, Travis Whitaker, right. and then a girl called, uh, her name was Jenna DeLulio. Yep, Jenna DeLulio. Okay. And so we all kind of told our stories. And so I started first, I told my story, and then Rob Eastman got up and told his story. Now, the great thing about people's stories in recovery is uh, they're somewhat similar but completely different. Mm-hmm. So mine is talking about how to find the fight in you and how to overcome uh, things that are in front of you, how to forgive yourself. And Rob's more of a warrior for suicide. Right. You know, because a lot of times those things Anti-suicide. Go, anti-suicide. Yeah, yeah. Not for suicide. Yeah. Uh, and they for go, suicide awareness. Yes. And they go hand in hand. Right. And so I'm down there and uh, I'm listening to Rob. He's up there and he's doing his thing. He's entertaining mm-hmm. the crowd. He's getting his message across. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as he gets done, some lady comes up and talks to him. And all of a sudden they hurry off in this back room. Mm. And so then I get back up on stage and introduce our next guest and keep the night rolling. Because you were the MC. I was the MC. Right. And uh, just kind of keeping the night going. Well, I get a call the next day, and it's from Cole Thorpe, who's also been on the show. Right, Cole. Him and his wife, Amanda, put together this expo, and it was amazing. It was the best turnout they've ever had. They're already planning next year for May. Good. He goes, hey, do you got a second? And I go, yeah. He goes, did you hear what happened last night? And I go, "Uh uh-uh, what happened? You know, and I thought someone's going to be mad or something would happen. He goes, well, after Rob got off, some girl came up to him. And I said, yeah, I watched that. And then they scooted off into the back room. Mm -hmm. And he goes, did you hear why? And I said, "Uh uh-uh, why? He said that lady was walking down the street, had a backpack with a gun in it. She was going down to the park. She was going to take her life. She had never walked down that road before. I'm getting chills just telling you this. And saw the signs to the recovery expo. I said she wasn't planning on going. No, she didn't even know we were having it. Saw the signs. Wow. Walked in, walked up top, sat down in the back, and listened to Rob Eastman talk about suicidal thoughts, ideology. His suicide. His suicide yeah. attempt yep. and all that. And when he got done, she felt compelled to go up and talk to him. Mm. And he, she was like, I, I need to talk to someone bad. 
Yeah. And there were, luckily there were some therapists that were down there in the vendor booth area. Mm. And so they took her inside. They talked to her. Wow. That's and they, cool. And, and, they, and they got her therapist on the phone. And then so I called Rob. I go, what was that? And he goes, yeah, it was crazy, man. And it was it made me think that I'm doing the right thing. Oh, definitely. I mean, what the timing of that. That's yeah. That's beautiful. That saved a life, probably. Yeah, she, no, she said she had gun and backpack and was going down to the park and she was going to end her life. Wow. But something compelled her to walk in there and sit down. And she didn't even know the expo was happening. Well, that's amazing. What do you think it was that compelled her to go in there? You know what? I've been trying to think that, you yeah. know, and, and sometimes we need an answer of what it was. And I don't know what it was. I'm just grateful that there was something. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think, I think that's a good point. Um, I don't think we have to overanalyze what it was. I think a lot of people filter that through whatever their belief system is, but whatever it was, it was important. And, and it served a very, very important purpose, whether you want to call it energy or the universe or divine intervention. But the reality is that, uh, I think we all ought to get better at listening to those prompts and, yeah. and that that feeling of where to go and what to do, because either you might be the person that needs it, like she did, uh -huh. or you know you might be the person that's providing something for somebody else, like Rob was. Yeah, I mean, what are the chances that Rob's going to be there, that she walks in and needs to hear that message right and at that right time? that she didn't walk in too late, and it was somebody else talking. But she could have walked in on me uh, and went, like, this guy yeah. sucks. Well, probably not. But I mean, Rob's message was meant for her. Yeah, obviously. You know, a lot of people have been asking me lately, uh, you know, uh, about my beliefs. And, you know, we just did that thing, uh, the power of prayer. We did recovery. a special yeah. episode. Yeah. Is that going to air? That went out that, on that, the radio. It, it's already happened. So, it, And we just dropped it out on the podcast. So we, you oh, could, just dropped it. Because so so I've had a few people ask me if that was going to be a podcast episode. Yeah. So you can download that now. Uh I'm a firm believer in the world gives you what you want when you need it, mm -hmm. not when you want it, because no, sometimes those that are would be nice, though. It, it would be great. <laughs> you know what I mean? To have a right. drive up service of what you want when yeah, you want it. And that sure sounds would. like Burger King. Right. But it, it gives you what you want when you need it. When you need it. Yeah. And I've had a lot of things happen to me. It was like, wow, this is crazy. But this is exactly what I needed. I needed this victory. I needed this win or I needed this lesson because without this lesson, I don't know if I'd be able to get to the next place I want to go. And I don't even know where I'm going, but I just want to keep moving forward. Right. So the other day, well, it was last week. I'm golfing with this guy. And part of my job now is to golf with people and take them out and have a good time. And the guy I'm golfing with likes to imbibe, likes to drink. Mm -hmm. I don't drink. But I don't care. That's okay because I'm secure in my sobriety and I'm okay with it. Sure. And he's drinking. And the other two some with us, they're drinking. So three people are drinking. Did any of them ask your permission no. or make it awkward? Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. okay. Because a lot of them I know already. Okay. And so this young gentleman, he starts to drink. And he told me, he goes, ah, man, I need to drink because that's, that's how I golf better. And I go, that's a lie you're telling yourself. I know this because I used to tell it to myself. Yeah. But you, you were that direct with him? Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, okay. And because I know him. Yeah. And we're going and he over imbibes a little bit. Yeah, it happens on the golf course. You, you know, and afterwards we're sitting there and we're settling up bats and we're talking. And he goes, why didn't you stop me? And I go, because it's not my job to stop you. Right. It's your <laughs> job to stop you. That's pretty. But that's but then it made me think. And that's why I brought it up on this podcast today is because a lot of times people say that mom, dad, honey, kids, why didn't you stop me? Right. But it's not their job to stop you. No. It's their job to support you, to help you, to guide you. But well, they can't you, do you, it for you. You prompted him with your statement. I mean, you weren't ignoring him completely you were saying you know instead of saying yeah that's right you golf better and say you didn't validate his no alcohol no you, i was just it, 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 that's a lie yeah i, I know because i lived it right so i mean what more does he want from you no and and, and no he's good and, and 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 i talked to him and he's fine and he and he apologized and i go i get it i i, I 100%. but that's common right people yeah. make other people responsible but that's an addict brain. Yeah, is yeah. That they don't want to own it. They don't want to accept it. They'd rather pawn it off and blame it on everybody else. But the reality mm -hmm. is when your life starts to mess up, and it will, everybody's life does, Yeah. the only thing you can count on is that you're the one constant. That's true. You know, yep. in all the situations. And that's kind of what I've been talking Plus about. Plus, you guys were betting, so I'm sure yeah. you were. You didn't want him to stop drinking I went on the too back early. Nine. Right. Well, yeah, I went on the back nine. I can tell you that much. <laughs> uh, but that's the thing is that... Um, Bad things happen to everybody. 
And the only thing that we can really control is how we react with the information that's presented to us. Fair enough. Right? Yep. yep. We can get mad. We can get happy. We can cry. Well, I talk to people about that all the time. It's You don't want to get into this self-blame like, you know, if it is to be, it's up to me. And then you get down on yourself when things aren't good. I don't think that's healthy. But the reality is it's, it's your perception and your behavior at the end of the day that determines your experience, right? Mm-hmm. And so because it rains on everybody, you just need to be the guy who brings an umbrella. Yeah. Right? Like like life is throws us curveballs and difficulties and um, a smart person owns their situation. Smart person also reaches out for help and, and asks for help. Like if he, you know, if your friend had been thinking, um, maybe I shouldn't drink today while we golf. I don't want to drink today while I golf because those thoughts ping around in people's heads every day, right? Um, It would have been a smarter move for him to say to you, hey, I want to be in the cart with you because I know you're not drinking and I'm going to try not to drink today. Just, you know, reach out, get a little support. Yeah. You know, instead of what all of us have been capable and guilty of doing in the past, which is, you know, dish out that responsibility on others, right? The reality is, and this is a a thing I talked about the other day at at a women's business lunch. Yeah. I'm not a woman or a business owner. Yeah, you probably had a lot to share. But I spoke at their lunch. Yeah. uh, Is that nobody gets out of this world trauma-free. Whether it's physical, mental, emotional, uh, professional, nobody gets out trauma-free. Right. And the reality that we're not going to, bad things aren't going to happen to us is just naive. And we, uh, or I think what's even the, the, the most common naivete in that realm that I see is people are like, if I'm doing all the right things, then I won't have problems. Right. Yeah. Like, like if I, if I'm being a good citizen, if I'm treating people right, if I'm doing all the good things, you know, if I get up, make my bed first thing in the morning or whatever their list is, yeah. then they think, well, then, then when tough things or bad things happen to them, sometimes there's a total meltdown. They're like, what? Their well, whole world collapses. I've been doing everything Instead right. Instead of just accepting the fact that that is that is part of the experience. Yeah. Every day, no matter, no matter how hard you're trying or how hard you're not trying, tough stuff is going to come your way. But if you've been doing all those right things, you are going to be a little bit better prepared for oh, when definitely. bad things oh, happen. You can, I mean, you can avoid all the stuff that's of your own making. Yeah. Right? Like if, if, you, if you are thoughtful about what you're doing for yourself... And, and you're being proactive every day, you're going to reduce pain in life tremendously, but stuff still comes your way, right? Always. And that's why I like that saying I mentioned earlier, you know, it rains on everybody, but some people learn to bring an umbrella. Mm-hmm. It's, that's just, you know, there are things out there that are going to happen. Or some people like dancing in the rain. I guess you could do that too. I do. You're a good dancer. I'm pretty good. Yeah. Well, I, no, I, let me rephrase. You're an enthusiastic dancer. I'm pretty good. Yeah. And enthusiasm, that's that's half the battle, In right? fifth grade, my mom hired two guys from downtown Ogden to come up and teach our neighborhood break dancing. Break dancing. Yep. Oh, those are the days. Did you have, like, the cardboard out on the garage had floor? A beauty, no, she had a beauty slot shop. Uh, you got to break dance in the Yeah, we just moved slot? the chair out. Yeah, the whole neighborhood wow. came over. <laughs> we, we popped it out. Oh, the Shadow Fat Valley Breakers. Band. Yep, yep. Hey, we got a great show for you today. Chris Hill is our guest. Uh, he's how how many days into recovery? Just shy of eighteen months. Just shy of All eighteen right. months. We're going to hear job. about his story coming up next, right here on KSL. Hey, welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That is Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist and recovering from COVID. How are you? I'm a COVID recoverer. That's right. Yeah. You think you're going to be a long hauler? I sure hope not. And you actually had to explain that to me because I wasn't familiar with the term, but those are people that are struggling with long-term side effects of, of COVID. Right now, it's been, um, it's been my, my uh, uh, well, I got the brain fog, obviously. Yeah. yeah. I was a little worried about that coming on today because I've had a little bit of uh, word finding problems, which is really interesting to be like having that happen to yourself and observe it in yourself. Um, but I've had that fatigue, but last Friday was my last day. So it's been less than a week of, um, of quarantine. Like I'm out of quarantine. I'm, I'm cleared to go back to work and, you know, with a mask and protocols, see patients and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty tired. Yeah. But But yesterday made me hopeful today. I'm kind of tired again. I, I feel like, you know, give it a week and I'll probably be back to normal. Now you feel like everybody who listens to this podcast, who's in recovery. 
Is that how they feel? A lot of it, yeah. Sure. I mean, I yeah, some days are really good. Some days oh, you feel like part, you took yeah, a step yeah. back, and then you just have to keep getting yeah. up every morning and pushing forward. Progress is not linear and consistent, for sure. So I you love have that. to take it when you can get it. Our guest today is Chris Hill, and uh, Chris Hill has been sober now for 18 months. Uh, he's reached out to me on Facebook, and then I run into him everywhere. I ran you into the We Are One Recovery Expo. Uh, I ran into you with the Weber State football game. Uh, we were talking before this started. We have a lot of mutual friends. But we've also got one thing in common, and that's that we both went to Pinnacle Recovery. Okay. The only difference between me and Chris is Chris got a tattoo of Pinnacle Recovery on his arm. Did he really? Show him real quick, Let's buddy. See. Yep, that's the oh, house the of the house. Yeah, that's the house I stayed for forty five days. Really, he stayed there for thirty. We're going to find out more about his story a little later on through the podcast. But where does the story of Chris Hill begin? Um, born in Memphis, um, moved out to Utah in eighty five. So age of five or whatever. My uncle was in the Air Force. Got my dad a job on base to get my dad out of um, sticky situation back home. Mm-hmm. Um, so moved out here and. Been out here ever since. Grew up in Roy. Okay. Um, Brothers, sisters? Got two brothers and then an adopted sister later on in life. Yep. So I'm the middle of three brothers growing up. And what was childhood for you like, Chris? Childhood for me was, it it was fun. It was cool. A lot of sports growing up. Played baseball, basketball, football. Excelled in all three. Um, Strict parents, you know, coming from the South and stuff. When we moved out here, I remember getting made fun of by all friends or, or them asking, like, what is this? Why are you, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. I was like, well, that's just how we were taught. That's how we were brought up. In fact, if I don't call it, if I don't say it to your mom and dad, I'm, I'm getting beat by my dad. So, you know, just that's ra- a, that, raised with manners. and Yeah, it's interesting when I'll meet somebody once in a while who you can just tell, even if the accent isn't there, the yes, ma'am, yes, sir, very, very well ingrained in the in the Southern culture, especially Texas, Midwest, that kind of area. Yep. Right? Yeah. And it's just a re- I kind of like a respect, it, though. Right? I like it, though. I, I think, see, I think that's f- interesting because back in the day when I, when we grew up, Casey, um, you didn't call your friend's parents by their first name. No. It, it was, was Mr. Smith or Mrs. Anderson or whatever, you know, or, or some the LDS uh, Brother. Brother or sister. But there was that respect, right? Right. And nowadays, people are like, you know, hey, Matt. And I'm like, hey, you're like 12. What do you, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. My daughter's friends call me Stussy. And I was like, why do they call me Stussy? And they go, they thought that was your name. And so now everybody just calls me Stussy. And you know what I do? Yeah. Hey, guys. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm sure you roll with it. But I, I like I like the Southern culture of, of having that yes, ma'am, yes, sir, respect. Mm-hmm. I think it's good for kids. So you said you had a pretty good childhood. Yeah, you actually said awesome. Right. And um, do you remember the first time you ever tried substance or an alcoholic drink? I absolutely do. All right. Well, substance, yes. Alcoholic drink. I mean, my dad was a drinker growing up, alcoholic. Um, and so, you know, we snuck in and, and had a beer of his or whatever multiple times growing up or whatever mm-hmm. but substance really yeah I, would I, you say your dad was an alcoholic absolutely. like he drank too much is absolutely. that what you're saying yeah. so were, did that what was that like as a kid did that cause problems in, some in days it was good some days it was bad i mean you know looking back now i feel like we we're kind of a product of our environment and stuff and so you know, looking back at my dad and his upbringing and where he grew up and everything, I mean, Mobile, Alabama, you know, strict parents and everything, it, it makes sense of why he did a lot of the stuff he did. Mm. Like, even though I may not agree with our upbringing or his idea of our upbringing, mm-hmm. you know, um, it makes sense. You know, Well, that, I think what you said is very true. Like, in many, many ways, we are a product of our environment. Mm-hmm. And, and it's interesting when I talk to people, sometimes people will say this or that behavior is genetic, right? Right. And and a lot of the times the answer is no. It's just so ingrained in your in your patterns of thinking and behavior and what was modeled to you growing up that you feel like you don't have a choice but to behave or act in a certain way. But the reality is it's just that those early life experiences, the the home you lived in, the neighborhood you lived in, whatever the prevailing culture was, um, things start to feel automatic and because that's just how the world is for you. 
I mean, you look 20 years back and you go, how did you think I was going to turn out? Right, right. <laughs> you right. Know I mean, I mean yeah. let's, let's really just put it up on a storyboard. You yeah. drank and all this other stuff. How did you think it was not? And I'm not saying that's not always the case. There's always an exception to the case. But right. we've had many people who sit down on this podcast who say, I wanted to be the one to break the chain, right. to break the cycle. I, and, and exactly. And different. And I, you know, I, I know the science and there, we, we do consider alcoholism as an example. It is a disease mm-hmm. and there are genetic and inheritable predispositions that run in families. And so that's all true. But, but that we shouldn't ignore the fact that the, the other thing that runs in family are behavior and modeling, behavior right. and modeling all, you know, your whole life growing up, if alcohol was part of every event, why would you assume that that it wouldn't be part of every event in your adult life as well? I mean, it just seems it's like, well, I wear socks with my shoes. That's just what I do. Yeah. Right. And so um, when a person has um, kind of a moment of clarity, often caused by some sort of crisis or trauma in their life, that's often when they say to themselves, I want to break that pattern. Some people say that when they're young because of you know trouble in their home growing mm-hmm. up and they see they somehow put two and two together that the drugs or the alcohol are the underlying reason why our family struggles. Uh, sometimes it's their own struggle when they're older, you know, adolescent, young adult. Uh, but when you have that insight, you realize, man, I, the, what I can do to break, the, I can't change my, my genetics, but I can change my behavior. And that's, and that's very powerful. My modeling. Yeah. 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 And then you can model something healthier to your kids. That's right. So you say you remember sneaking drinks from your dad as a kid, you and your brothers, I assume. And even being offered them. From my oh, dad and stuff. Yeah, so. I was like, hey, I, I, I mean, I'm not throwing my dad under the bus, but I remember when I was at a certain age, I was like, hey, dad, can I have a drink? You know, and he begrudgingly mm-hmm. would let me. You're like, oh, okay. But it, it was almost a reward. Well, what, what is what was the original vacation where? Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, he sits down with Clark Rusty and, Rusty and he goes, can I have a drink? And Rusty <laughs> pounds the beer. He's like, that was me. Good talk, dad. Yeah, good talk, dad. But was alcohol your DOC? No. Nope. And so where does your DOC be? Come in. Um, I mean, drug of choice for me it was meth. I mean, even as much as I hate it, and I hate hearing myself say that. I mean, that was it. You, you know, know, I don't like to judge a book by its cover, but sometimes I can tell when we have our guests come in and go, "Okay, this opioids, this is heroin." I don't see you and see meth. Right. Well, good, good. I mean, I did weed. First time I smoked weed was over the summer of sixth and seventh grade. Not by choice, really. It was uh, my, best, my best friend's older brother. I wake up one morning, um, and he's kneeling on top of me, you know, like, hit this. I'm, you're not getting up until really? you hit this. Yeah. So he was forcing you. He was. We yeah. haven't had that story very no, often. No, uh-uh. Yeah. He was, and, you know, at the time. Do you like think I, it was funny, or was he just, was he, like, on a that, that's rage? That's just him. Or, yeah. I mean, I don't want to throw out a name, or it, but anyone that knows him, I mean, that's just him. That's him, yeah. That's him, you know, and so... I remember hitting it a couple times or whatever and getting up and making my way to the front yard and grabbing onto the tree. Like You'd just, have been 12 years old. I yeah. mean, yeah. Lightweight. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that was the first, you know, substance I ever taken or, or anything. Did you like that feeling? I or? did not like that feeling yeah. that day. Yeah. But I know by time, even going into seventh grade or whatever, I was partaking in weed, you know, more regularly. Mm. And then it, it kind of caught on and. I mean, my parents divorced in between uh, eighth and ninth grade and, you know, chose to go with my mom, as did all three brothers at the time, and just for the freedom, right? I mean, my dad's strict and and I guess you can say abusive or whatever, you know? Well, let me, let me ask you this, though. I, I, I'm not challenging that your dad was strict, but I want to know, was he strict but inconsistent? Because that's the case with a lot of really strict parents is you never know when they're going to like ignore you. And then sometimes they come back and they're really strict. And that's really tough for kids to handle. I would say with me, he was pretty consistent. Okay. And I would say out of the three brothers, I kind of had it made, you know, and I, I don't know if it was, I think a lot of it was mainly just how good I was in sports and stuff. And so, and my dad was my coach in all three sports up on base growing up and stuff. And so... You know, I I got the praise from him. I got the praise from mom, you know, and my older brother had a different dad, but was adopted by my dad, you know, before I was born or whatever, after I was born or whatever. 
but it seemed like my dad was really, really hard on my older brother and then really nice on my younger brother. And then my mom always sided with my older brother, you know, just to kind of combat how bad my dad was. To level the playing field, if you will. Yep. And then mom kind of was short with little brother because dad favored little brother. And I was in the middle and I had it the best out of all three, you know, but it was still like, I just, I don't know. I couldn't watch him at times the way my dad was with my older brother just made me hate my dad. It made me not want to be like that, you know, Mm -hmm. ever or, or what. So, so you had it pretty good. Uh, your parents get divorced. Uh, you're in eighth grade. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys decide to stay with your mom, you say, because a little freedom. more freedom. Yep. She worked rotating 12s. And so, you know, she was home half the time, it seemed like. Um, I mean, she's awesome. My mom is one of the most amazing people on this earth. You know, she did what she could raising three kids growing up and, and provided well, you know, considering. But having that freedom and kind of being in the scene of, already you know by ninth grade dude it was it was weed it was mushrooms it was acid it was it was all that i mean that seems quite a quite a bit for a ninth grader yeah i was a mature ninth grader i would like to think you know has anything to do with that but i just i mean yeah but i mean it seems like a lot to to be to be going with yeah and i but i think it's also sort of a product of that that age that early adolescence is a very a lot of impulsivity, yeah. you know, a lot of uh, thrill seeking. So you get these kids that are about, you know, 11, 12, up to 14, 15. And that's a time in life where you're like, I want to try and run and do and everything. And uh, when a person gets a taste for a drug, then that can often result in the sort of uh, the medley of drug use where, you know, poly substance abuse is what we call it, where people are like, yeah, whatever I can get my hands on. Is that how you kind of felt at that time? Yeah. And we got our hands on a lot, like even as ninth graders, because that same guy that kneeled on my shoulders or whatever, like I was best friends with his little brother. And those two from junior high on, I mean, they, they were in any and everything and always had a lot of it. They were pretty wild. Yeah. And so with my best friend, you know, always having something or whatever. So were you guys drinking while you were doing the, you know, I, for the longest time, you know, not wanting to be like my dad, or whatever. I didn't drink until I was in high school, you know, and then it wasn't until, um, 10th grade, I think in between 10th and 11th grade, when I got introduced to crank or speed or whatever Mm -hmm. that, you know, you do a line, you go to shoot, do a line and stay up for two or three days back then, you know, off that stuff and go to, go to high school party or whatever. And everybody shows up with their cases and natty or, or whatever. And you could drink all day, still be sober and be the last one standing the next morning or whatever. So, so just for <clears throat> clarification for Dr. Matt, <laughs> um, is crank the same as meth or is it, is it different? Because I, I mean, I, in my, in my head, I'm thinking, well, I think crank is meth, but then I was like, I've never done it, so I don't know. It's different. I mean, same kind of thing. It's speed or whatever. Yeah. Crank was back, you know. Gosh, I don't want to date myself too much, but I guess mid nineties or whatever. Okay, right. My don't ninth worry, we're tenth, plenty older than you, yeah. buddy. You know, ninth, tenth grade year or whatever, and then it seems like crank kind of fizzled out or whatever, and and meth popped onto the scene. Yeah, meth became more the the flavor of choice. Yeah, you know, back. Yeah, kind of. I mean, crank was dirty and you know you hear stories of it being cooked in bathtubs and and stuff like that but you know Mm -hmm. you can go buy a 20 bag or or whatever a quarter gram of crank and stay up for a weekend wow and get brain damage yes absolutely (laughs) absolutely right right and so so tell me about the first time you tried meth because you said that's your doc when we say doc that means drug of choice that was the what you preferred over anything yeah it, it was. I mean, I enjoyed weed, and I, you know, from from ninth grade on, it was wake and bake every day, even for school and stuff. It was, you know, even coming home from high school football or whatever, you know, it was smoke a bowl as a giant Advil. It's, it's not always just to get stoned or whatever. It was like, you know, come home beat up or whatever, and just do that, and it makes your body feel good or whatever. So, I remember, dude, it was. In 97, I think, um, was when I, 96 or 97 was when math come around. And it was, it was, 
you, you do it the same way as crank or whatever. You know, we were smoking it at the time and snorting it, and it was just cleaner. And it just kind of replaced crank. Crank just kind of went away, and meth meth popped on the scene. So, and I, there there are cultural shifts in drug use and what's you know what's available and what people are into. If you want to think of it that way, I don't really hear anybody talk about crank anymore. Is that out there still? I don't think. I so. don't think. So, I haven't yeah. seen it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. in my last two go rounds or whatever, it's always just been meth. Right. So. So walk me through the first time somebody, did they have to sell you on meth or was it just like, okay, let's give it a shot? No, it was, well, um, you know, just know what the feeling was and stuff, like crank and stuff. It, it, it's fun for the first three or four days. It's fun. You stay up, you know, you feel like you're getting stuff done, rather it be, rather it be stupid stuff or cool stuff, like either hanging out at a bar or whatever or, or you know, hanging out at someone's house, drinking and stuff. You know, you can drink all night without getting drunk and be social and everything. You're, it's just an opera and stuff. Um, but I have an addictive personality. You know, I never, I can't keep it to just the weekends or whatever. It always seems to just flow in and and stuff. And so. So how old were you when your first time you tried meth? Oh. You said it was 96, 97. Yeah, so 17. 17. Yeah. Did your drug use ever get you in trouble at school or with sports or with your parents? Did anybody ever sit down and go, hey, Chris, you might want to take a look at this? Yeah. So, I mean, my 10th grade year was last year I played any sport. You know? oh, so you'd been quite an athlete up to that point. Why yeah. did you stop in 10th grade? I think priorities just switched. Partying was funner. School mm. wasn't as fun, you know. Um, sounds like, so you said the big three, so you played football, basketball, and baseball Yep. and you must've done pretty well. Uh, got a lot of adoration from your father when you decided to quit playing. How did that affect your relationship with your dad? Um, I mean, it was strained once the parents divorced anyway, you know, not much contact with them or anything. Okay. I mean, here and there, but just had no reason to really, you know, uh, 15 years old. So you weren't doing the visits on the weekend to no. dads and all that kind of stuff. No. Nope. So, I mean, I'm sure it hurt him, it hurt my mom, but you know, at the same time, my mom trying to support three kids, she just work, 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 yeah. you know, and what about friends though? So I played a lot of sports growing up and you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, what my life was like growing up and sports are a big part of that. And, and not really, I don't really remember all the scores and what we won and what we didn't win. I just remember the friendships, right? Like having fun with my buddies on the bus or before the games or after the games. Like that's where a lot of my friendships were developed growing up. How about your friends? If you'd been that involved in sports and then all of a sudden 10th grade, you dip out and you're done. Did that, I mean, maybe it didn't affect your relationship with your dad much, but what about your friends? Well, I was in a little different situation cause I grew up playing all my sports up on base. And so it wasn't with the kid. I played football and stuff against the kids that I went to school with. So, what, in elementary so, so I don't even really know what that means. So we're talking about Hill Air Force Base yep. in uh, Davis County, uh, mm -hmm. Utah. And uh, what I didn't know they had sports teams for kids up there. They don't. I, I'm not sure if they do anymore, but when I was growing up, they did. Okay. And so, you know, we football field is right by the runway and by the golf course. Um, we played our basketball games at the youth center, played baseball, kind of intertwined with you know, Leighton and some Kaysville teams and stuff. And okay. so, but it was mostly like, military kids or people who worked on base. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. And, interesting. And, and so in 10th grade, you, you would have moved over to high school. Yep. You, you did do high school up there. You did it. Yeah. I, I went to Fremont high and played, uh, and I kind of got lucky because I didn't really have the, the grades to play my sophomore year, but it was also Fremont's first year opening. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if they got the transcripts <laughs> or not. And so I was able to play sophomore football. But then, um, yeah, right after sophomore football stopped, um, I was on the wrestling team but didn't have grades and then just pretty much quit going after that. So and We're going to take a break here. and When we get back, we're going to find out a little bit more about uh, – Chris's story and eventually get to the point where he put a tattoo of the recovery he sent, went to on his arm. Stick around. You're listening to Project Recovery. So, Chris, by your own admission, you stopped sports after 10th grade because you didn't have the grades. You found the party life more entertaining uh, and you got more a priority uh, and, and, and all that. Um, tried meth when you're around 17. Uh, I've never done meth, but from what I hear, it's almost an instantaneous 
uh, addiction. Did but, you feel that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. From the first time, I mean, I was hooked. Yeah. Do you do you remember what it made you feel, or because a lot of times on the podcast we'll have somebody go, "This was the first time I felt whole, or not afraid, or felt like I was the person I was meant to be." Did it do any of those things for you, or were you more of a, a guy who goes, it, "It just made me not feel," and that's what I liked? I think it was just fun. I think it was fun at first. You know, I'm not one in the early days or whatever. I mean, this last go around, absolutely, a lot of the the doing and stuff was not to feel, not to feel the shame when I look in my kid's eyes, not, you know, that, but early on, like it was just fun. You know, and and it's interesting that he says that because a lot of people ask me about mine and, and, and there are people that get into an addiction without a trauma, You, 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 you know, that, that at first you did it just because it was fun. Right. That's uh, sensation seeking, especially when you're 17. You just want to have a good time. Uh, meth has been described to me by many, many people as just a feeling of euphoria. Just like, oh, I just feel mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah, and like you said, like stay up for two, three days at a time. Which sounds am- horrible. Um, that sounds horrible to me. Uh, but if you're feeling euphoric, you don't want it to end. Like if, if you just feel like you're on top of the world and you have all this positive energy, So I think when people first try meth, it's not just the power of the drug, which is very, uh, very strong and and can create addiction just biologically very quickly for people. But I think it's that feeling of just a positive, happy, euphoric energy that gets people coming back for more and more. It's, It's kind of a double whammy, unfortunately. Now, throughout this podcast, you've mentioned a couple of times this time or this time right. or this time. So after you started Meth at 17, how long did that run go for? Just about a year that time. Um, I remember it was 97, so my senior year. Um, got got in a big fight with my mom and actually picked up the radio receiver and threw it at her. As soon as it left my hands... I started crying, and I'm like, I'm done. Let's go. Like, I'll go wherever you need me to go. Were you guys fighting about your drugs? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. But that was so shocking to you that you would do that, yes. throw that at your mom, that it, it was like an instant kind of awareness that I need help. Yep. yep. And so did you go get help? I did. I went to uh, out to LDS Hospital um, where I slept six out of seven days I was there, and then come home and, and made it from 97 to... Like 04 without doing it or 03. A good six, seven year run. Mm-hmm. And then what made you try it again? Ran into some buddies, right? And it it just, it looked fun. You know, the, the lifestyle. I think that, sometimes the memory goes, right? Yeah. Like you get, you get so many years into not using something and what you start to remember it, it is selective. Mm-hmm. And so when you get the opportunity, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I might want to feel that way again. And I think there's also some sort of power of going, I've kicked this once. This time's going to be different. Sure. Now, I know as an addict that this time isn't going to be. Arrogance yeah, of the it, arrogance of it, right. This time isn't going to be different. But there's a lot of people but who that's... take it out for another run going, well, I've got this new ed- this new knowledge, this new education. I'm older now. I'm older, yeah. wiser, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I, I, I'm just going to do it on the weekends or, you know. Just this one time. Just this one time. You know, sure. I, I've got this. And so you, you said it just looked fun. Yeah, it did. And, you know, at this time I was – what, 24, 24 years old or whatever. Great job up on base. Um, had my own house, you know, uh, toys, cars. You Were know. you married at the time? No. Nope, not married. Uh, single dad at the time. I had full custody of my, my oldest boy. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I mean, yeah, and then just hanging out. You know, so when you live that, that lifestyle or whatever as a single dad, you know, and then you see your friends that don't have kids and stuff out mm-hmm. going to the bar and, and partying and staying up. And, Picking up and chicks. That. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know. And that's well, a little unusual for a 24-year-old guy to have sole custody of yeah. his child, right? So you were, you probably didn't have a lot of friends in that same position. If if they did have kids, they might have had a spouse there to help take right. care of the kids. But you were on your own. Yeah. And I mean, I had my, my first kid young. So I had Skylar when I was 15 years old. 15. 15. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And now, you know, and, and when I had him or whatever, I was your normal fit. Well, 15 year old or 16 year old, you know, still just out playing and stuff. So I really, 
didn't become a father probably until he was four or five years old. Well, and that's the, I mean, developmentally, that's one of the many reasons why it's tragic in a lot of cases for people to have kids when they're in their mid to late teens, because you're still a kid yourself and you're just not ready to take on that responsibility. At what age though, did you get full custody of your son? I think it was five or six years old. You know, after I, so you were just like 20, maybe 21, mm -hmm. something like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so I had the, the job up on base, bought a house, everything was able, you know, and it was, it was a mutual agreement between the mom and I, you know, it just better, uh, better opportunities, better upbringing and everything. She didn't feel like she could no. provide those and, things. And she was already, I don't know if she was remarried or not, but I think she already had another kid or two at the time too. And I was like, you know. And was so, she your age? She's a year younger. You're younger. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, yeah. what were we doing when we were 14 you know, watching cartoons and I stuff. I was trying I to know. finish. Uh, you were breakdancing. I was breakdancing break and dancing. trying to finish yeah. the last level of Super Mario Bros. Right. That's a tough one to get Princess 8. P. 8.1. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that was the level. That, I know. 8.1. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, I'm just, you know who you're talking to. Yeah, I know what you're okay. talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, so you're 24. You try it again. Did it escalate quicker than you thought it was going to? Yeah. It did. It, um, you know, my... I can sense you're getting a little, like, this isn't easy for you to talk about. Um, it's not bad. I mean, it, just looking back, I should have saw the signs or whatever, but you don't when you're in it. And I'm not only do I have the addictive personality, I'm also not the type to, like, just go buy 50 bags, at, you know, $50 bags at a time. It, whatever I'm doing, I have a pocket full of it, and I'm selling it to where I do it for free, you know, like, this isn't bragging or bolsting and, and or what, but, but you're an I've, always, in I, I've guy. always had connections of, you know, I mean by, yeah. And so, you know, probably two, three, I bet two months into it, you know, I've already got quarter pound and then slinging it myself and just knee deep in it. You know, I, that's why I love the saying. And, and it's so true. You know, you pick up right where you left off because, mm -hmm. You know, I bet three weeks into it, I was as bad as I was on my worst day in 97. Wow. You know. And so how long did this run go for? For about a year and a half was all. And then uh, I ended up getting busted and getting into drug court. So. And you were selling and distributing at that point. Yeah. And so that's a, a lot bigger uh, consequence than if you'd just been using well, and I got lucky too. When I got pulled over, we were able to shove all, you know, eight out of nine bags up in the dash of my Audi or whatever. And they caught the one bag that yeah. slipped as, I mean, we're pulled over, lights are shining, you know, it's nighttime or whatever. And I'm passing them to my buddy and he's put, you know, with arms underneath the light from the cops, mm. like shoving them up in the vent hole in my dash or whatever. And we dropped one. Okay. You know, and so we got caught with the one bag, and so otherwise the <clears throat> the, the consequences would have been yeah. large because of yep. the amount. Is yep. what you're saying? Probably okay. prison time. Probably. But instead, you lucked out um, and ended up in drug court. Mm -hmm. And what did drug court do for you? Drug court changed my life, man. Um, you know, it, I didn't even know what drug court was when I got into it, and I still remember, you know, the first time I went to to court or whatever getting high that morning or whatever and go to court and standing up in front of the judge. And he's like, okay, well, you know, we're going to need you to UA. I'm like, all right. So I remember walking out with the counselor into the bathroom or whatever and just acting like I couldn't piss. Uh huh. Well, I'm not dirty if I can't piss. Right. Yeah. And so we get back and go back in front of the judge and he's like, well, uh, unable to produce is the same as a dirty. So bailiff, you can take them out. And so, I think I ended up doing just two days in jail and getting released to Page at the time, which was a residential uh, spot in Ogden. I, I'm pretty sure it was just affiliated with drug court. Well, there was people in there also that sure. wasn't in drug court or whatever, but um, just a day or two in jail was enough for me to realize, like, I cherish my freedom, you know, and I am smart enough when I get in trouble to do what they tell me for as long as they tell me to do it. And I'll even give you a couple more months just in case something's lingering, you know. So ended up getting in drug court and 
Yeah, it was cool. I mean, it was hard as heck at first because I kind of knew and it was told to me and I, and I listened that, you know, you just, you got to cut off all ties, cut off all ties. And to me, that, that was all my friends or who I thought was my friends and who Everybody I was running thought with. was important. Uh-huh. You know, and so it was, it was kind of a lonely time at first, but it was good. You know, um, made it through drug court without a single infraction. Had I been able to pay my fines off on time, you know, I, I would have made it in the shortest amount of time that you can complete drug court. And so that, that was cool as heck. And I remember even after completing drug court, you know, I think I went another six months or so without a drink, without smoking weed or anything. And, you know, from age 16, 17 to 24, like I smoked weed every day and was just so pro weed. Yeah. You know, and uh, I remember the first day I had a drink, you know, after drug court in that, you know, about two years clean or whatever. <clears throat> Got some Michelob Ultras, right? And I remember having one. Because you're watching your figure. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Right? Makes sense. Yeah, ballooned up after getting <laughs> off crank and getting clean, you know? You know, that's interesting that he says that because when I was in recovery, those who were on, like, heroin, opioids, and meth, they gained weight in rehab. Sure, yeah. Those who were on alcohol lost weight. Yeah. Right. And so you could, uh, you, I mean, it was just like the before and afters because, yeah, if you're on all that other stuff, you don't eat. Right. And so, you know, that, that first night of having a couple drinks, I was, we were living in the apartments right across from El Monte um, mm -hmm. up there. And I remember two beers and then halfway through my third beer, I was like, you know, I looked at the girlfriend at the time. I was like, babe, I want to smoke a bowl. You know, of weed. She's like, you do? I was like, yeah, I do. And so I called a buddy, ended up going right up the road. It took like three hits of weed. Took my beer with me up the road, right, to his house. Took like three hits of weed, come back home, same half beer in my hand. And I ended up coming home. And, I mean, it's wintertime outside or whatever. I remember stripping down to my boxers, opening the sliding glass door, and just sitting down, you know, like this, spinning. I'm like, babe, don't touch me. If you touch me, I'm going to puke. <laughs> Leave me alone. Let me be here. Whatever, and some good things come out of that because I bet you know. And that was oh four, oh four. So in the last seventeen years, and I've I've fell off two other times, but in the last seventeen years, I bet I've smoked weed thirty times. You know, it just it, the last couple times or or ever since then, it affects me. Exactly like it did that first time when I went out and hugged the tree. Yeah. You know, and so. Not a good time. No, not a good time at all. Right. Paranoid, you know, just. And they, they often call that a paradoxical effect that, you know, the, the, the effect switches and does a 180 on the person. You become nauseous, dizzy, uh, paranoid. Right. It's a very unpleasant experience. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I like that. I like the fact that it did that. And I mean. I you like it because it discouraged you from continuing to smoke or yeah. what? Yeah. yeah. It's kind yeah. of a natural way of yeah. turning you off of it, huh? And I, you know, I know there's a lot of good out there, I think, you know, that can come with weed and people and stuff. Well, we're learning but, a lot more about it for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm not against weed or, or people that smoke it. It's just not for me, you know, it, and more so now that, you know, I have three more kids and being responsible and stuff, it, it, it doesn't have a place in the work in the workplace too. You know, I know I got to be responsible and keep a job and right. getting high on weed is not going to trump being responsible. So doesn't fit in the plan. Right. So after drug court, you have that moment of sobriety. Then you drink some Michelob ultra, go up and get a bowl. And when you said some good things came up out of that, but also some bad things, what happened? You know, drank a little bit throughout that whole time, you know, um, and I've never, I've never drank to got to get drunk, you know, it would be, uh, come home from work, have a cocktail, you know, a rum and Coke or whatever and go to bed. And it, and those weren't even daily on the weekends, maybe have three or four social, you know, a responsible alcoholic, maybe it, it may be referred to, you know, even though, like I said, never really drank to get drunk. And do I look at myself and my history as, am I an alcoholic? 
absolutely. You know, learning what I've learned in recovery and just by definition, sure, absolutely. And so, you know, made it from 04 to 09 without touching meth. So another good little five-year run or whatever. And I'm How does your friend meth come back in the picture? I don't even know if I could tell you the day or the instance or, or what it was, but I, I don't know. It got you. It got me. And, and at this time, are you married? Nope. Still not married. Still not married. Still only have the one kid. Um, but it got me and, and got me for about a year. And what year was this? Oh, nine. Oh, eight to oh, nine. Because then I got, um, I got busted again in oh, nine. And this one wasn't drug related. Um, it's did something stupid, but it got me into Dora in Davis County. And once again, I am smart enough when I get in trouble to do what they tell me for as long as they tell me to do it. Cause you know, this time I did, I think two days in jail or something, but then 69 days work release. And it's just the fact of not sleeping in my bed at home and sleeping with in a dorm of 30 other guys. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't like that, you know. I like <laughs> no, my own, I, I, I like my own bed where my girlfriend's at and, and stuff. And so sounds like a bad summer camp. Yeah, right, right. And so how did this affect your job on on base? I'm just kind of curious. Like these. Well, things. and so I I got let go in '04 mm-hmm. when that did. Ended up getting back on up there, um, and then up until '09, I believe I quit that time. You know, I was, I was up there as a contractor that time and, and quit when I got in trouble. Mm. So so then, oh, nine, you go to Dora. How long do you spend in Dora? I think like six or nine months. It, was, it wasn't a, as intensive and everything as, as drug court is. You know, a couple classes or whatever, you, random UAs and all that. But once again, past flying colors. Um, after Dora, put in a 402B or whatever to drop the... Uh, felony down to a misdemeanor Mm -hmm. and then yeah and so was that your last run with meth it wasn't oh she comes back she comes back so how long did you have sobriety in between this one 10 years 10 years 10 years made it to 19 2019 yep and how did how did she introduce herself this time in the form of coke at first you know, um, started dabbling in Coke with some friends and stuff. And it was more, you know, just the, the hanging out and, and staying up a little bit later and being able to drink a little bit more or whatever. Now, are you married at this time? Nope. Still single? Or, no, no. I am married this time. Yeah. I got married nine, 10, 11. Okay. So after Dora and after I cleaned up and stuff, um, you know, by this time I got two kids with my wife now, um, we had the kids were born in uh, 04 and 05. And so, yeah, I mean, I just cleaned up and kind of looked at my life after Dora and stuff and like, you know, just thought not only for the kids, but like, I love this woman, you know, and she's, I've known her since 2000 on and off, you know, we've been dating since 2000 and it's, I just made the decision I'm ready to settle down and, and that and. Yeah, so we got married 9, 10 of 11, and then, yeah, so eight years with the wife before coke and, and meth comes again. Now, uh, a lot a lot often on this podcast, we talk about a rock bottom. Sounds like you've ran into it four or five times and stopped digging and dug yourself out of the hole, but unbeknownst to you, there's a hole a little bit further down the road that right. you can't keep from going in. Right. So you go into this one. What is the rock bottom on this last... This was the rock bottom this last time, you know, all those other ones. I'm not sure if I hit it or not because, you know, it was getting in trouble and having to clean up, getting in trouble, having to clean up, you know, I mean, yeah, it's a choice. I could have chose not to and, and went further down. Well, you proved it, but you also proved that you could do the sober thing. Right. Multiple times. Right. And I, I think that's a good thing. But it's also a bad thing for an addict because they go, look how many times I've got myself in the situation and got out. Yeah, you get a little cocky. You start telling yourself a, a I lie, know in my addiction right? I did. You know what yeah. I mean? I, 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 I somehow talked myself out of it 
or remembered it different or somebody covered for me or whatever it was. And I thought, well, it's not that bad. I mean, I've, I really have suffered no real consequences yet. Right. And, and I absolutely love you get cocky or overconfident because that's what happened this last time. Right. So dabbling in Coke on the weekends or whatever, but always go to sleep on Sunday and back to work at Monday. You know, responsible during the week mm-hmm. with Coke. Well, then the weekend comes and we couldn't we couldn't find any Coke. And a friend, not really knowing my history, um, shows up in my house with a bag and two rigs of meth. Now, a rig, is that for? <laughs> That's a syringe. IV. Right. And you know, at this point, have you ever done it IV? I did in 09. Okay. That little stretch, you know, after mm-hmm. being against that way of doing it my whole life, right? Yeah, I, I started that in 09. And then, um, so when he showed up at my house this time with a bag of meth and two rigs, you know, it's like, all right, I should be, and this is Friday. I can do this. It's only a small bag. Yeah, we can get high on Friday and Saturday and I can go to, go to sleep on Sunday and be back to work on Monday. Sure. No, no. Didn't work that way. No, no. Come Monday, I still hadn't been to sleep. So, wow. you know, and, and by Wednesday, quarter ounce in my pocket and in a box of rigs and just quit going to work 100 percent ended up getting fired again from hillfield and was just off to the races and so what is your wife saying now you got two kids at home and you haven't slept in days you just lost your job <sighs> well I, I wasn't coming home much either right because i didn't want to hear what the wife had to say or i didn't want to see my kids you know believe it or not And that was the hardest part with this. I mean, obviously, none of them were happy. And, you know, in that 10-year stretch, one of the things I was most proud of, and still to this day am most proud of, is the fact that, you know, my kids were three and four the last time I was out running amok. And I had a – in this 10-year stretch, I mean, it it was awesome. I mean, I coached my boy in football every year. Um, I attended all my daughter's cheerleading stuff. Like, I was that cheer dad. Oh, I'm one. It, it even bought shirts and, and was proud of it and all the out of state competitions went to them and stuff and and it was just good so I felt like I was that role model dad and in a sense I kind of was you know and then so but then once meth grabbed me this time and stuff like I bet within a matter of a month month and a half like they wanted nothing to do with me and they were mad at me and stuff and and rather than waking up and seeing that and, and dealing with it then, I mean, I coped in a different way, just get high and disappear for a week or whatever, you know? And so, so that's when you were using it to numb and to not yes. feel. Yep. Because anytime you got sober or looked in your kid's eyes or your ex-wives, you saw what they saw. Yep. My and, wife's. Yep. And that's not good. No, nope. And it hurt and the guilt and the shame and don't want to feel any of that. Right. So quickly go numb it you know, and get out of there even. Like I'd try coming home when I knew the wife was at work and the kids were at school, you know, just to shower and get clothes and and grab stuff and get out of there before they come home. So when does it come to a boiling point? A lot of boiling points in there, but the boiling point, I mean, um, mid-April, early April, you know, pressure has really been being put on by them. And like I just... Um, well, even before April, so my birthday is December 30th and December 29th, I remember being home and being up in the, in the bathroom or whatever, taking a bath. And by this point I've started dabbling in heroin too, right? I mean, I couldn't get high off of shooting meth anymore or whatever. So just to get high and get a different feeling, you know, we were throwing in a little bit of heroin in there too and shooting meth and heroin at the same time. Mm. And I remember this day because I come home and had one drawn up or whatever, took it in the in the bathroom with me. Um, I remember doing it and then getting in the bathtub. And I remember as I lay in the bathtub, I'm sitting there like, I better get up before I pass out, you know. And so I remember it hitting the drain on the water. And next thing I know, I wake up and my wife is just on top of me like, trying to get me to come to and then I look and my daughter's standing in the hallway you know and so Mm. 
And then my initial reaction, of course, is get her off me, right? So I force her off me or whatever, grab a towel, like, and she's just yelling at me the whole time, and my daughter's crying and stuff. I remember uh, getting my stuff, calling calling my buddy Jer up, and going and staying with him that night, and going with him to work that next day. And that next day, just just chilling with my buddy down at work, like, was the most sombering moment I've ever had in my life. Like, sitting there thinking, like, what if I would have OD'd and, and died last night? Like, what is my wife doing today? What do my kids feel like? Like, does my mom really have to tell her friends that her son died from a heroin overdose? You know? And it was just, it was the longest, most sombering day that I've ever had in my life, you know? And crazy thing is, is I didn't do heroin again until mid-March, you know, for a couple months. Uh, I probably stayed off meth for a day or two, but then just went right back out. You know, just didn't want to So you had this, this sort of almost like a vision, a premonition. You really spent the day kind of perseverating on the idea of like, all, how it would have affected your whole family, mm-hmm. how tragic that would have been. And that's the power of addiction. You're right back at it a few days later. Yep. Huh? Yeah. Even something like that, my daughter seeing that and stuff wasn't enough to get me to quit. It was enough to get me to quit heroin for three months, right? But then go out and just right back in it. And, you know, a couple months, once again, getting harder to hit myself. Veins are going down and stuff. I'm having other people hit me up. Um, not really getting high from meth, no matter how big or how much I was doing or whatever. So started sprinkling in heroin again. And then I just remember, you know, early, early April or whatever, like I was just tired. You know, I was tired. I was beat down. I was, uh, tired of not staying at my house, you know, cause kids hate me. Wife hates me. Um, my mom lives right up the road from me. We live on the same road. You know, and, and just me and my mom are very extremely close, and I don't think I'd talk to her in months, you know. And it was just, I was beat down. And then I remember April April 14th, me just saying to myself, dude, tomorrow's the day. Like, I'm done. I'm it's also tax day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And so get up the morning of the 15th, and like any addict that knows he's going into – treatment or whatever right do one last big one up and told the wife get in the truck let's go she jumped in drove out to pinnacle and the whole way on the drive there like there was never thoughts of turning around or not going like my mindset was i'm doing this i promised the kids and my family 30 days inpatient so i'm going and i'm doing 30 days and even when i pulled in the gates like, I, I was so ready for it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, from the time I drove in those gates, I bought in wholeheartedly and gave it 100% effort the whole time I was in there. And, you know, to the to the point of even, you know, you're going to make co- phone calls to family or whatever periodically through the weeks and stuff. I think I talked to my wife three times. I think I talked to my mom once and my brother once the whole time I was in there, like, when I went in there, I was there to, to work on me and to, focus. Get, to get right. Yeah. Yep. And for 30 days. And the cool thing was, you know, with it being COVID or whatever, I didn't have to worry about my mortgage not being paid. I didn't have to worry about any of that because there's kind of the COVID relief or where you didn't have to pay your mortgage at the time. So I went in there with, you know, really nothing to worry about at home and was able to just go in there and focus on myself. And for 30 days, I bought in wholeheartedly to everything that they were teaching and selling there. And What I love about this, your personality style, and it's very similar to Casey's and a lot of people, you know, you've got this all in, 100%, you know, personality, which will sink your ship faster than anything if it's focused on something like drugs and alcohol. But it's also the same personality trait that makes you successful in things. And it sounds like when you turn turn that corner, you did it and you applied that personality to your recovery as well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and the difference this time, I mean, other than by my choice of getting clean and stuff, um, this is the first go around that I've ever just engulfed in recovery. 
right? I, I call it living the recovery based lifestyle. You know, before even that 10 year stretch, it was a hatred towards meth. I didn't go to meetings. I didn't do any IOP. I didn't do any recovery based things, get togethers or anything you like that. You were just not using. I was just well, not using. You weren't using. in recovery, really. It's right, simple at because. All. You know, in the four or five times that you danced with meth um, and got busted, you went to drug court, you went to SOAR, you did these things, and you, by your own admission, said, oh, I just did what they told me. And I could do that. Mm -hmm. But you did what they told you because they told you, not because you wanted to. Right. And that's the difference, is that when people go, why are you sober? Because I want to. I'm not doing it for KSL. I'm not doing it for my kids. I'm not doing it for anybody. I'm doing it for me because it makes sense for me. Now, all these other people get a benefit from me, but you can't do it for somebody else. And I and people will fight me on this every once in a while, but that's not how it's done. You have to want it for yourself. If you don't yeah. want it for yourself, it will never stick. If you feel like you're doing sober because of all these other things, you got to realize that you're better this way. Nobody's better on drugs. Nobody's better on alcohol. Nobody's right. better. It, it, that's not how this works. Now, well, sometimes that's how it gets started. Well, that's what that's the right? lie that they tell you. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah, right. yeah, right. right. And I think what's really cool is you're talking. You use the term lifestyle, living the the recovery lifestyle. So that's that's what Casey's talking about. Is you make a lifestyle change, and that lifestyle change, a real change in who you are and the life you're living is and it starts internally. Mm -hmm. And what's really hard, we've talked about this a lot on the show, a lot of people have their feelings hurt that you couldn't stop for them. And 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 the the addict has to be careful that they don't beat themselves up for that. It doesn't mean you don't love your family. Right. Mm -mm. It doesn't mean you don't value your job or the profession that you have. Uh, it's that's that's why it's a it is a disease that will rule your life, no matter how much you love other people, right. no matter how much responsibility you feel to take care of your kids. If it's got a hold of you, it's got a hold of you, and so that's why. Make it, you have to do it for you. Yeah, and like you said, there was just you were sitting there and you were like, there was no thought. I love how you said that. There was no thought of turning around, right? Because something had changed inside of you. You were ready for this to change, and then that allowed you to shift the lifestyle, right? As opposed to just spending ten years not using, which right. is not a shift in lifestyle. It's a shift in use, but it's not a shift in lifestyle. And then I go to recovery, right? And, and introduced to a whole bunch of stuff that I've never known or, or practiced or anything, right? I've never meditated in my life, you know? Pretty um, awesome. Absolute game changing. Yeah. You know, mindfulness. I didn't know what that was. Right. You know, and, and I think when I was in there, a couple of things that opened my eyes or, or that I found out about myself was, um, you know, A, with the way that I was being a dad, was exactly how my dad was with me, you know, in a sense, even though I was never laid a hand on my kids or anything like that. So different in some ways, but very similar in others. I was raising my kids by intimidation and mm. I don't feel like kids nowadays. You can't do that. Where's the intimidation when you can't spank them, right? Uh -huh. I mean, you spank them. You're the one going to jail now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and in I'll, a I'll sense, venture, and so, I'll and, venture a, a, a statement and that is that, even though corporal punishment and intimidation were common back in the day, didn't mean they're right. They weren't healthy. They weren't effective. Right. And and when you realize that, how did that make you feel? That you were like, I'm still doing basically what my dad did. Well, it made me take a look at myself, right? And um, and I didn't like it. I didn't like what I saw. You chose to not go live with your dad for those reasons. Yep. That must have been sobering in and of itself to yep. be like, holy cow, would my kids choose to not be with me? Right. Be, if, if you're acting like your dad, right? I mean, oh, you become the parent that you didn't want to be with. Yep. And so like one of the biggest changes, and I don't know if this just clicked when I was at Pinnacle or what, but um, I became a listener too. You know, I became a listener. And I know throughout my life or whatever, I'm sure I've exercised empathy with, with other people and stuff, but I don't know if I fully grasped like the meaning of empathy and exercised it with everyone I come across with, mm -hmm. you know, and those, those two things becoming a listener, um, empathy with the, everyone I come across, like it's been life changing and, and yeah. for the better. 
you know. So how are your kids and your wife now? Relationships stronger than it's ever been. Isn't now, that crazy? now, now, did it happen day one? No, and I knew this coming home, right? Like I wasn't afraid to come home to my older brother who could still wrap me in a pretzel to this day. I wasn't afraid to come home and see my mom who by her own admission is just a mean old Southern woman. She's so she's got a heart of gold, right? My wife's, she's got some fury in her, right? Puerto Rican in her. So I wasn't afraid of that. Dude, the one person I was afraid to come home and see was my daughter. Right. And I played that out like so big, you know, we like to play things out yeah. and, and make them bigger than we thought and stuff. And so I knew I wasn't even as much as I wanted to come home to hugs and kisses from the daughter and, and wife and stuff. Like I knew that I had done some damage. Right. And that things weren't going to happen on my time table. And I, and I was all right with that. Like I took my responsibility for what I had done in that 12 month. I eat us. Right. And so coming home, I still remember, I can't remember if it was the first night or the second night. Like I walk in my daughter's room and I was just like, Hey, can I have a word, word with you? And she's like, yeah. I was like, babe, I'm going to sit down. Right. And I just, I sat down and I, and I spilled my guts to her. Like, and I, I still remember exactly how it started was a, you did not deserve what I did the last 12 months. Um, you are not responsible for it in any way, shape, or form. One hundred percent on me, and for that, I'm sorry. Um, I know you're mad at me, and I get it. I, it's understandable, one hundred percent. I just want you to know that I'm going to do my best, day in and day out, to show you that I love you, that I care for you, that I want the best for you, and that I'm changed. You know, and I bet it was only a, a 15, 20 minute conversation, but it it was a it was one that needed to happen and it was a great start. And, you know, ever since then, like I, I have few goals in life, but the main ones are just to become a better human being. Right. And do the next right, best thing and lead by example. And so I know, right. Looking back on the past, I don't forget what I've done or anything, but I don't, I don't stay in the past either. Right. And maybe that's one of the reasons I haven't started the steps. Right. I feel so comfortable in my recovery and what I've been doing so far. And that's worked that I don't really want to look back and, and pull up, dredge up all that old stuff that you got to do in step four or whatever. And with that being said, dude, I, I believe any and everyone can prosper from the steps. I just don't know. I want to go back and look at it because I feel like what I'm doing and stuff is, is working. But, um, yeah. Well, I think we've talked a lot on the show about, it. you know, there are a lot of different ways to, you know, to be recovered and, mm -hmm. and to be in recovery. And uh, the steps certainly are tried and true and very effective right. for a lot of people. Uh, there may come a time uh, farther out where you want to go through some or all of those steps for various reasons. But I think the key is finding something that's working for you and, and working your plan, you know, doing what's working for you so that you can meet those other goals that you right. just mentioned. I love it. Dr. Matt, uh, I appreciate Chris stopping by and sharing his story with us. It's been an amazing story and one I think that our listeners will really relate to. But if you had to do a takeaway from Chris's story, what would it be? Hmm. A takeaway from the story. Um my takeaway, I guess, is sort of along the lines of what I just said, and that is that um, when a person f uh, makes that internal change or, you know, that, that, that switch flips to change, mm -hmm. uh, they'll find the thing that's working for them. They'll find programs and methodologies that help them reach their goals because they want to be different. And I can tell in talking to Chris today, he's excited about the fact that he's been able to find something that works for him. You know, to see a big burly tough guy with a killer beard, like light up when he talks about mindfulness and meditation and his daughter. Wow. That's, that's a guy who's growing, you know, that's so what recovery that's, looks like. That is exactly what it looks like becoming that best well-rounded version of yourself. And so I, I sincerely appreciate Chris coming on and, and I, I feel uh, like uplifted from listening to his story today. 
the thing I like about Chris's story is, uh, you know, multiple times throughout his story, he talked about moments of sobriety and where he got to it from drug court or Dora or whatever else got him to that sobriety. Uh, but the, when the fl- switch flipped, like you said, is when he wanted to do it for himself. He mean, by his own admission, and those are the things that I could do. I, I can do anything for a short period of time. I could do any. It's like a diet. You know why diets don't work? Because it's not a lifestyle change. Right. Anybody can lose 15 pounds in a month for that cruise. But if they don't change their lifestyle, that 15 pounds is going to come right back on. Right. And so you you have to make a, a lifestyle. And that's what I like about Chris's recovery now. It's a lifestyle. I've seen him out and about. I know he's doing great things at the SOAR and our friends Dustin Hawkins. Uh, he went through Pinnacle. And, and, and those are places that mean a lot to me and have done a lot for the community. And I think that you're passing it on and you're sharing your story and i think that's why recovery looks so good on you my friend i think you're doing wonderful things and thank you for stopping by no absolutely thank you for having me and don't forget uh project recovery is a ksl podcast and it's brought to you by our friends at knowyourscript.org we love you and we mean it